My name is uh, Michael Appenzeller. Uh, I'm a co-founder of two companies, which I would consider as part of, you know, whatever fintech is. But you know, we do use technology to to change the value chain um, in the financial service industry. So those two companies are uh, Nectar, which is you know, recently got. Um, um, rebranded um, is almost seven years old, and then the second company is Fundbase, which is um, which is an online uh, marketplace for hedge funds. In fact, the leading uh, marketplace globally. Um, yeah, I'm a co-founder of both, um, and um, you know, uh, the found these two companies have been the best decision in my life so so far. I'm a Zurich guy. I'm, I'm Swiss, so born and bred in, in Zurich. I uh, you know I have a business background. Uh, you know, after university in the eastern part of Switzerland, some Gallen, um, I joined a strategy consulting firm uh, specialized in asset management. Then I joined one of the largest at that time, or one of the to be largest um, alternative asset managers in Switzerland, Horizon 21. Scaled the business from practically zero to, you know, uh, billions, 14 billions of assets on the management, 160 people. Left that company to go smaller even. Um, was a um, COO, CFO partner in a in a in a convertible boutique. You know, built it up from scratch, barely a table in the office. Um, to a regulated institutional asset manager with alternative and, and long only products. And after that, that was 2010. Um, the world, you know, sort of overnight, seemingly seemingly only has changed. Is after Lehman when when we founded uh, what you know was yet to become Nectar. The company was named Etops before. Um, a company that had one mission and vision until recently, just you know, be a, an outsourcing provider to asset managers, um, family offices, um, wealth managers, um, hedge funds, and, and even banks. We built the company up to um, 50 people, 30 billion um, um, under operations, as we call it. We take everything from asset managers' plates that, that creates complexity, you know. Uh, complete things. After the trade, we do everything. We put in technology, we, we help them with daily operations, we help them to run their business sometimes almost completely so they can focus on decisions and their clients. Um, we did this, uh, I believe, quite successfully using third-party technology and decided some, you know, I guess two years ago to, you know, that actually the industry needs more than just more efficiency. The industry, the industry needs radical change because it doesn't produce um, what it should do. And you know it's been doing that wrong thing for decades. So that's why we decided to change the game and you know, produce our own technology and use technology really to um, um, change the value chain. So in my eyes, if you, if you want to call yourself FinTech, which I think you know, is an awfully inflated word, I, I don't like it, um, but at least you should try and you know, work extremely hard to change the value chain in this industry. Because only then you can do change, right? If you paint stuff um, a little bit of a nice website and do all kind of marketing, you're just losing, you know, using, using, using up your own time, you're wasting it and using up money. That's not what you should do. So we're trying to, we're trying to change and um, design the value chain new. Um, that's our aspiration. And then that's, that's what I think is needed. So that's what we do in Nectar, and we do the same with Funbase in the hedge fund market and, and, and a really archaic uh, market. Today we have, I don't know, nobody knows, but we might have 20, 30,000 hedge funds. And the market is not equipped for that. It's still the, you know, you know the guy, have you heard about the guy? Does he let you in? It's, it's kind of like, it's working like the drugs, you know, market, you know, like the market for cocaine. You got to know the guy that knows the guy that knows the guy, and then somebody needs to protect you and, you know, reputation is everything. The problem with that market is it's illegal drug market and you don't get good drugs. You don't know really what the quality is. And that's the same with hedge funds, right? It's exploded, but it still works like the drug market. That's dangerous. Um, and there is a perfect field to use technology to, to bring transparency into the market, to sort of like legalize or democratize the market for hedge funds. So we put on all the data, we make it transparent, and it give everybody, like, you know, it could be you and me, using that technology to be a world-class hedge fund um, investor. So that means that this asset class, which is probably one of the most valuable um, uh, um, asset classes, but the one of the baddest, you know, the worst reputation, you democratize it. We want to give people and, you know, first and foremost, professional investors, a tool to be 
uh, a good hedge fund investor. And what you do with that is you help, you know, you create a situation where, you know, you help the world's savings problems. I always say it sounds big, but quite honestly, um, savers today are in a bad position, right? Where do you want to invest? You put your money. So why not diversify more? And one of the first uh, things you want to look at is hedge funds. It's, a, it's an awful lot of talent out there. You just want to be able to find it and invest in it efficiently. So that's what um, fund-based does. And that's, for me, as an example, use technology um, to bring um, investors and, and the subject, you know, the, the, the managers, you bring them together more directly using technology. You democratize the, um, the interplay between them and you establish a market. Uh, today, there's no market, really. It's, it's like, you know, it's like the drug market. Fundbase today is as large as the very largest um, institutional investors into hedge funds, right? And that's done through technology. So you can actually um, gain market power as a tech company that before um, only you know, those, those, uh, those large institutional investors had. So that's, that shows a little bit how you, how you can tweak the value chain. I don't say it's easy. It's hard, right? That's why you're called entrepreneur. Entrepreneur sounds funny, but it's actually, it's painful. With Nectar, I would say the majority of clients is, is Swiss still. Um, <clears throat> with Funpays, it's quite a global clientele. From the outset, we had New York um, as as a co-headquarters of Funbase. Now Nectar also has offices and people in the US. So, but Funbase, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of clientele comes from um, um, the US as well. And we recently formed um, a joint venture in Hong Kong. Um, so Asia is for us a big, uh, a big market um, where, we, where we actively look for business and partner with, with uh, uh, interesting, really interesting people. A lot of people get it wrong in that they look at geographies, but if you really look at a wealth manager, I mean, you got to break it down into separate issues. The problem with this market, by the way, is it's, it's complicated. If you look, for example, at Swiss wealth managers and compare them to US wealth managers, it's astonishing. They're, they're really similar. Um, they're really in a similar spot with regards to many, many things, right? Access to investments, um, you know, they need to institutionalize the game. Both are still kind of heavily relying on retrocessions, for example, still. In similar spots, they need to grow up, but, you know, kind of um, uh, how to do it, it's complex for them. Um, and, okay, one thing is obviously different. In Switzerland, you have a wealth management culture whatever that means, right? So, uh, you know, hundreds of years of doing wealth management, whatever that means. Um, in the U.S., you've got more of a brokerage and, you know, a little more of a trading culture. Um, people are, you know, more self-driven. And, and, you know, obviously there's this wealth management which brings a lot of secrecy, um, even though I think the banking secrecy, you know, some guys uh, a couple of kilometers from here have destroyed it. Um, it seems to still be the law and everybody, you know, sort of, it's still the last thing they hold on to. Um, so that creates a culture of, you know, data protection, data secrecy, you know, it's all great. Uh, it creates a bit more complexity for tech providers. Um, in the U.S., it's just simpler. Um, you set up, you know, your things on Amazon Cloud. Everybody sort of acknowledges the fact that, the, you know, the government is, is listening in. That's, that's okay. You know, they're a step further there, I believe, to, to be fair. Uh, here in Switzerland, and you know, you have the secrecy stuff. That's doable. I just create some tech hurdles, which which we obviously know how to handle. But, but in many things, you know, we look at the market in uh, in market segments. So you look at you know, high net words, ultra high net words, uh, wealth managers, family offices, endowments. So those segments, I think we see global trends, and then we look at those segments and try to um, try to you know um, uh, work with those segments as we as we see fit. Yeah. I think if you're a real entrepreneur, if you really want to do it, if you, if you sort of somehow you know, came to this planet and need to do it, it doesn't really matter where you do it. Right? Uh, I, don't, I don't like the, the sort of attitude to say in Switzerland it's harder because of government and regulation, that bullshit. It doesn't matter. You, you go out and do it, right? And if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if there's not enough space here, then okay, do it like you know, we did. I mean, we, we had New York, we have Bratislava, now we have Hong Kong. It doesn't matter, right? Um, I don't want to blame anybody. I mean, Switzerland is just a great place. It's uh, it's beautiful to be here, um, and it's it's a good place to start. Um, as an entrepreneur, you should be used to you know um, sort of carve around and, and be flexible uh, of obstacles, which are gonna be everywhere. They're just different, say in the U.S. to here or you know in Asia, and I don't want to blame, right? 
as an entrepreneur, you, you, should be, you should be used to, you know, ride around obstacles and climb above them. I just see that fintech is overhyped. It's a lot of bullshit in it. It's a lot of air in it. Um, and the problem is, I recently got asked in, a, in an event, you know, so what are some of the low-hanging fruits and what are some of the long-term um, potentials you see for fintech? And I, I hated and loved the question at the same time because I think there's no long-hanging fruits. And I believe a lot of people, you know, the first are starting to realize it and a lot of people will realize it. It's not easy. You don't do things the easy way in this market. Because if you think about just a simple trade, right? if you want to buy Novartis shares, you know how this you know, goes from the stock market into a private client's portfolio, it's already complex. So we know more or less how this works. But even that simple trade in certain value change creates a lot of headache, burdens the end client with a lot of costs, too much cost, way too much. Um, and, then, and then you think about things like hedge funds, let alone private equity or illiquid assets, which some of the, you know, uh, the, the, the target clients of, of this industry need to control and, and manage. That's completely uh, messed up still. So you got to understand what you're doing. And as I said before, painting is not enough. That if you paint, you can, you know, you better paint on a nice landscape. We have enough of them in Switzerland. So I think don't paint, right? And then that will be, in my view, the natural selection. So either understand every screw of the business, and, you, and, and even then it's awfully hard. We hate a couple of things here in this industry and we want to change them. Is that disruptive? No, no, I mean, we're partnering. We want to partner, uh, we're open. Partner with the established firms. Like, you know, we, we love the banks. Love the banks, that sounds great. Um, but in a way we have to love them, right? Because they're part of the, um, the infrastructure and they're part of, of, uh, of the market. And um, there's, there's ways where both can profit from each other. You'd be stupid to, to just call yourself a disruptor and haha. And that's another thing, right? So if you're too, if you're just disrupting, just because you want to be disrupting, you're not going to achieve anything in this market. Every market, and this is a powerful one, a very opaque one, has an immune system. So you got to watch it. So I, I see a lot of people that just go out there, I want to disrupt, you know, I go directly to the end client and do this, you know. Yeah, let's see. That's uh, it's tough. And people have discovered that before. So sometimes I don't get it, right? So look, look west, right? Look what Silicon Valley does or did. They failed a couple of things. So just have a look, have a close look, and then you'll see what works and doesn't work. I mean, most things out of Silicon Valley actually don't work, right? Where everybody thinks, you know, I'm, the, I'm the next Uber. Well, let's see what, you know, let's see about the fate of Uber anyway, right? You know, it's actually relatively simple. That's the, the mind-boggling thing. It, it is simple and a problem is solved on paper. There's just the industry and the infrastructure is not supporting it. So what you got to do is you got to um, slash the costs. But, <clears throat> I mean, we've looked at the figures and that's only, you know, if you compare <coughs> your saver to the world's, you know, most successful um, multi-manager investors, say, you know. So you get a gap from every year. And, um, between eight and 20%. That's performance, right? So, so we're talking about working two years longer. And that's great, and it's in the pension fund example, but what if we could add a little bit to these returns? So what you gotta do is you gotta look at costs. That's 30% or so maximum that you take out of the gap, maybe 20, 20 to 30. And then what most um, investors don't have because they don't have access to it is diversification. Um, there's more risk factors than just long only equity and little bit of fixed income. Those two I wouldn't invest in anyway for the next decade. So what else is there? It's not only hedge funds. I mean, what, what's hedge funds anyway? That's sprawling, you know? What I say is risk factors that you got to take into account. You got to understand them. You got to um, be able to, to have access to them at the fair price. That's not given at all for 90% of this investment world. So that's what we're doing. My, my companies have, have one goal, to close that gap as much as we can, right? And we don't do it by being disruptive and going to the end client. We, we work with professionals because we think these professionals, um, they do a good job at having a, a relationship to, to their clients and, and, you know, which those clients need. Um, you know, most clients don't want to be alone. They want to delegate. They have other stuff to do. So we give them technology so that, you know, 
they, they, they have more freedom, you know, to work with their clients and to become better, actually. And that has happened before in other industries. You give human beings technology and they become better. And that's our goal. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the interesting bit. Um, if you democratize the, the investment world more, um, uh, then hopefully more people get access to... Yeah, that's why we call the company Nectar, by the way, to Nectar, right? To the essence, to what you need and not just anything. 90% of people today are being sold stuff. We want to reverse it a little bit so that, you know, we give people tools and also advisors tools not to buy stuff, but to choose stuff, right? So if you reverse that, um, you've done a good job. That's, that's our goal. Why should I be able to order an Uber via a click and then uh, I receive a PDF that I can hardly read from my um, uh, financial advisor. So those two worlds, the gap is getting really wide and um, you gotta be able to, to you know, get your client, give them a better service. Um, those are just a few examples. There's many factors and I think, yes, um, people are ready. Well, they don't know it maybe, but um, if, if you solve problems, right? And if you make their lives less complex again, then this is a chance, right? Um, this, is, this is a chance to, to, to work with them. Yeah. Even before people knew what FinTech means, we um, spoke to the regulator in this country about uh, you know, being more pragmatic with asset managers, for example. So we were, the I think, the first ones to do it. And we found an open door. Um, sort of, you know, uh, people you could work with. Um, uh, and, and we, yeah, and we, we, today the regime is much more pragmatic as when it started out. This country has its strength also from a certain stability and from a certain slowness. Um, I wouldn't want that to change, even though that means, yeah, I mean, you know, like if you look, if you could always look at the little thing in the UK and say the FCA even, you know, wants, you know, supports fintechs and invites. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, that alone is great, but then the UK has disadvantages, right? This is a, this is a great market for wealth management. This is a, the, you know, the taxes are even lower here. Um, even though I think the UK is a very good spot, certainly after Brexit as well, but um, still, um, you can't do that. You can't just pick one thing. I would like sometimes Parliament to be faster. I would like our our, our, our government to be, you know, more understanding and, and, and stuff uh, of, of the real world. But um, it served us really well that they don't understand that much and that they sort of cancel each other out. Um, then you do less mistakes. It's great. I, I kind of love it here. I, I wouldn't criticize. It's, it's a good place to do business.